name is Susie Gomez, and you might be looking at me a little confused by my last name. <clears throat> um, I am Korean by heritage, Canadian by birth, Mexican by marriage, and American by immigration. Uh, my handsome husband and I have been married for eight years, and in those eight years, we've been busy because we had four kids. Uh, my oldest just turned seven on Friday. I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and an eight-month-old. Uh, and so, Biola students, if you love babies, if you love kids, and you don't have a criminal record, um, we are just down the freeway in Long Beach, so holla at your girl. Uh, <clears throat> All right, let's get down to business, okay? Uh, the woman at the well. Some of you may have studied this text before, and there's much more to that chapter than what was read, but we only have a little bit of time, so I'm gonna try to tell you the rest of the story. Um, if you've never heard this talked about from the perspective of a woman, well, today's your lucky day. Uh, I love this text for so many reasons, one of the biggest reasons being that we see Jesus in this text going out of his way, being intentional about giving somebody who maybe didn't feel like she had much value or much of a voice, value and a voice. Now, if you can't see from back there, I'm gonna step into the light and show you. I'm wearing a very obvious shirt today and I wore it on purpose. It says, I am a vital voice. I wore this today because I wanted to embody the message that I come to you today with because I believe that I have been assigned to preach this truth from the word of God. Uh, so I hope that you believe it too because we're not gonna waste our time this morning. Um, we are gonna hear God's word and I pray that we will be changed by it. Uh, so will you pray this quick prayer with me? Gracious, loving, and merciful God, you are good. So we ask this morning that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. God, may my mouth be faithful to speak your truth. Give me boldness, Lord, give me grace. Anoint my lips and may the hearers of your word be changed because we have heard from you. And God, make us thirsty for more of you because we know, Lord, only you can satisfy our thirst. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, have any of you ever been thirsty, like super thirsty? Like somebody will look at you and be like, ooh, they thirsty. <laughs> See, I know that I'm almost 40 years old now, um, so I know that you might be looking at me wondering if I know that there's a double meaning to that, because when you, you youngins, when you say, oh, somebody's thirsty, I know that you know that there's another meaning to that. And if you're sitting there wondering if you really know what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm gonna break it down for you. So in a relational context, if somebody says, ooh, that person is thirsty, it means that they're kinda desperate, right? Maybe that person is desperate for love. And I say love with quotation marks because a person who is thirsty in that sense might be hungry, might be thirsty for love, uh, but they're just so dang thirsty, so desperate that sometimes they settle for a cheap substitute. Right? Sometimes when we're thirsty in that sense, we know that we're thirsty for something that will really satisfy our thirst, but we settle for less. And sometimes even though we want the real living water to quench our thirst, we start sipping on something like a Coke, a Coke that really will make you more thirsty if you start drinking it because it's got all that sugar and carbonation and all that other stuff that's not good for you. But in the moment, you, sat, you, you settle for a Coke because it calls itself the real thing even though it's really not because you want instant gratification. So some of us, should really be looking for the thing that will truly satisfy our thirst. Now Jesus sat down by the well at the hottest part of the day in a very hot part of the world. Um, he met a woman who was thirsty. And upon first glance, it looks that Jesus is in fact the one who's thirsty. He goes through Samaria and he's been on this long journey and it was hot so he sits down by a well because he's tired. And then his disciples went to go get lunch because he was probably hungry, but he sits down and he's thirsty so he asks this woman for a drink. Now this is, this is odd because um, in this passage it says that Jesus 
had to go through Samaria. And if you know anything about the cultural context, um, it's odd that Jesus had to go through Samaria because for most Jews, if they were going from Judea to Galilee, they would feel like they had to go out of their way to avoid Samaria because Jews wanted nothing to do with Samaritans. So it's odd that it says here that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Why did he have to pass through Samaria? Samaritans were this half-breed, mixed-race um, people that the Jews wanted nothing to do with. They thought that they were unclean. So anything that Samaritans touched or sat on or let their lips touch would be considered unclean as well. And if a Jew touched that thing that was unclean, they too would make themselves unclean. So why would Jesus have to go through Samaria? Because for Jews, interaction with the Samaritans was like walking through dog poop in your new all-white Nikes. The only reason that Jesus would have to go through Samaria, leaving Judea to go back to Galilee, was if, in, if he was in a real big rush. Like he just had to pass through Samaria to get to his destination. But it seems as though Jesus was not in a rush. So it seems that Jesus had to go through Samaria because he had intention there. He was on a mission. So let's go on a journey to figure out what this mission was. We see in verse four that Jesus had to go through Samaria and as they were journeying, journeying Jesus was tired and he felt thirsty. So he asks the woman for a drink. Now let's switch angles for a second and let's, let's look at the text through the eyes of the Samaritan woman now. Um, it's about noon. The sun is at its peak, it's the hottest part of the day. And some scholars actually say that this woman could have gone to a well that was closer to where she lived. But she went a little further, she went a little out of her way to go to this well at the hottest part of the day. Seems a little strange, doesn't it? Now I'm guessing that at least a couple of you have tried this trick before. Have you guys ever put your headphones on or put your earbuds in, even though you didn't have any music on or even though you weren't talking to somebody just because you didn't? want to be bothered? It seems like this is the woman's way of putting her headphones on. She goes to this out of the way well at the hottest part of the day because she doesn't want to be bothered. She's walking to the well, she's approaching the well, and she sees this Jewish man sitting on the well. Well, well, well. She doesn't expect there to be a nice, pleasant little interaction though because she knew that as a Samaritan woman, this man wasn't looking to have a pleasant interaction with her. She sees him and she probably feels a little bothered. But she came all this way, it's hot, and so she probably thinks to herself, you know what, I'm gonna just get my water and go. She doesn't wanna be bothered. She knew that this Jewish man probably looked at her with disdain. She knew that um, Jewish men looked at Samaritans with disgust. There were strict rules about what you could eat and what you couldn't eat, how to prepare your food and when to eat it. So think about what it was like thinking about people if there were rules like that concerning food. Jesus would probably go out of his way to avoid this woman is what she thought. Not only was this woman a Samaritan, she was a woman. And it said that back in the day, you know how, how rabbis would uh, uh, pray in the temple? They would pray like this. They would say, God, thank you that you have not made me a woman, a Gentile, or a slave. Now, this woman probably wasn't a slave, but she was probably enslaved by a lot of things. And one of them might have been shame. I wonder if shame is the thing that kept her from going to the well that might have been closer to her. Or shame might have been the thing that kept her from going to the well when everybody else did, when it wasn't so hot out. And so she knew what this man probably thought of her. She'd been with so many different men in her lifetime, and it wasn't just Jewish men that looked down on her. It, 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 she probably kind of had a reputation with other people in her own village, because if you look further in John 4, it says that she had been married five times. So she wasn't exactly this Proverbs 31 woman. <clears throat> so I wonder if shame is what brought her to the well a little further from her house at the hot part of the day. So imagine her surprise when this Jewish man 
not only doesn't walk away in disgust, he looks at her and he engages her. And he asks her a question. He says, will you give me a drink? Now, I've been knowing Jesus for some time now. We've been walking together for about 20 years strong. I mean, he's been after me since day one, but you know, I'm a little hard-headed, and it took me a little while to figure out that Jesus was the one that my heart was truly longing for. But it's been a strong 20 years now, and so I've been getting to know Jesus really well, and I've, I've been walking in this love relationship with him. And so knowing Jesus the way that I do now, I can look at this text and be pretty confident that when I read this, um, I can see that my Jesus probably didn't talk to this woman in a way that was rude or disrespectful. When he asked her, will you give me a drink? He didn't say it in a way that made her feel devalued or looked down upon like other Jewish men might. Jesus is looking at her, asking her for a drink. Remember that Jesus came on mission to the world and and he came here with the mission to seek and save the lost. Remember John chapter three, just one chapter previous. We all know John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever, including the Samaritan woman, maybe with a reputation, he came to save people like her because he didn't come to condemn the world or women like the Samaritan woman. He came to save them. So when Jesus asks this woman for a drink, she says to him, well, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? She was probably puzzled by Jesus' tone because she, first of all, didn't expect a Jewish man to engage with her, but she probably thinks to herself, what is this that I hear in his voice? Is that gentleness? Is that respect? man, this is a little different for me. Remember, she didn't want to be bothered and she didn't expect him to engage with her, but now she's dumbfounded by Jesus and she's, she's drawn in by him. So now this is where we start seeing the woman's thirst. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw the water with and this well is deep. Where can you get this living water that you speak of? Oh, I skipped a verse, I'm sorry. When, you, when he asked her for a drink, she says, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. He answers her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. So the woman curious, she says, sir, um, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as also did his sons and his flocks and his herds? So Jesus, you got something better than this? This is the well that our father Jacob drank from. And then Jesus answers her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So then the woman says, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty again and have to keep coming here to draw water. Look here, Jesus, we both know that everyone needs water, but for me, it's a little bit more work to have to come here and draw water. So, so you're saying that you can give me something that will make my life maybe a little bit easier? Tell me more, where can I get this? And then Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replies. Then Jesus says, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man that you are now with is not your husband. So what you have just said is quite true. I don't know how you've read this in the past. I know that for me, maybe when I didn't quite see Jesus in this light, Um, I've read it maybe with a different tone. In this day and age of social media, you know that tone is everything and knowing the intention of of, of a communicator's heart, right? So, So maybe some of you are like me and you've read it like this in the past. When Jesus says this, I read it like this in the past. Jesus says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands and the man that you are now with is not even your husband. What you have said is quite true. But remember, Jesus didn't come to condemn her. 
Jesus reveals these intimate details about who she is, yes, to show her his power. He wants to show her that he is powerful, but not for the purpose of then saying to her, I'm powerful, now bow down and bow down to my authority. That's not who Jesus was. He wanted to show this woman his power because she wanted him to know, I am the Messiah. I am the one that you have been waiting for. So he does this in a tender way. People tend to write this woman off as, as maybe a scandalous woman. Um, like she's, she's that thirsty woman that we were talking about in the beginning, right? But if you look at this text, you know, it doesn't say that this woman was divorced five times. It says that she has had five husbands. So she's been married five times, but doesn't necessarily mean that she was divorced five times. In fact, in that culture, a woman did not have the right to divorce a man. A man would have to divorce the woman. But this woman, it doesn't say that she was divorced five times. Maybe this woman has had to go through the hardship of losing a husband to death. Maybe more than once. Whatever the case may be, this woman was married five times and she's had five hard things happen to her in the context of marriage. And now she's with a man who is not even her husband. How much shame is associated to that in that time and culture? So now this man talks to her in a way that intrigues her. And you know, even though Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, he made himself relatable to her. He showed that he was tired by sitting at the well. He showed that he was thirsty by asking her for a drink. So what this woman says next to him, maybe some people think that maybe she's just changing the subject uh, because things just got uncomfortable. Jesus outed her on the fact that she's been married five times and she's with a man that she's not even married to. So, so it might be like, you know, Jesus says this and then she's like, how can I switch the subject? She says, oh, okay, um, so I can see that you're a prophet. Uh, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but uh, you Jews say that we must worship in Jerusalem. Uh, what do you think about that, Jesus? Let's stop talking about my relationship status and start talking about mountains, Jesus. Let's talk, talk about something else because this is getting uncomfortable for me. But here's the thing. It doesn't throw Jesus off track. In fact, in talking about this, Jesus it, it leads him to revealing to her, you're looking for that thing, that worship, and I want you to worship in spirit and in truth, and what you are really looking for in your worship is in fact me. So Jesus wasn't thrown off, he had intention in this conversation with her, and it was all crafted in order that she may know that he is the Messiah, the one that she was thirsty for. He said, By showing you my power, I'm gonna give you power. In his interaction with her, he was communicating to her, other people may not have seen your value, but I see your value. And by revealing to you my identity, I'm gonna give you a voice. I want you too to believe that you are a vital voice. Because what does he do? He reveals to her his identity and he had intention. He had to pass through through Samaria and he waited there knowing that she was gonna come back to tell other people about him. He was empowering her to empower others. Woman, you have a vital voice and I want you to use it to give power to other people. Now, um, I picked up this shirt at Target. This one that I'm wearing right now, I picked it up in Target. And you guys didn't know that you could be on mission with God in Target, did you? I know I should get some amens for that. Um, But I also saw this shirt. It says, use your power to empower others. And I wanted to wear both of them, but I'm wearing this wireless mic. I thought it would be weird to kind of take it off in the middle of the sermon. So I just wanted to hold it up to you and give you a visual. This is what Jesus did with the woman. He said, I want you to believe that you are a vital voice. Biola, I want you to believe that you are a vital voice. You are here with intention, so use your power. The things that you are being equipped with, use your power to empower others. That is the heart of discipleship. Now after this woman has this encounter with Jesus and and, and she realizes that he is the Messiah, the one that everyone has been waiting for, what does she do? 
She drops her water jugs, leaves them there, and she runs back to her community. Now, I know that um, water jugs were very valuable back in that day. And uh, how many of you are like me, and if you left your phone somewhere, you'd probably be in a little bit of a panic? So you're here at Biola, but if you left your phone up in Malibu, or if you went down to San Diego for the weekend, it doesn't matter where that phone is at, it's valuable to you, so you're going to go back and get it, right? This is what that woman did. She left her water jugs there because she was communicating, you know what, this is valuable to me, but I'm going to come back to get it. She had intention to come back to Jesus because she knew she was going there to tell other people about him. Remember, when this woman goes back to the village, she goes and she has this urgency about her and she says, come see this man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? So it shows her urgency, her excitement that she left the water jugs there, but she wanted people to come back and see for themselves. She became the first evangelist. Jesus used someone like her to be a vital voice to empower others. Now remember, this woman went to the well at the hottest part of the day, at a well that was maybe out of her way, so she was a woman who probably kept her head down and didn't want to be bothered by other people. It wasn't like her to get up in people's faces and say things to them, so when she goes back to the town, she says, come, 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 you got to come with me. See this man who told me everything I ever did. It was probably really out of character for her. And so maybe when the hearers of that heard that they they didn't drop their water jugs and immediately go, but maybe after a few minutes, they started to have some curious thoughts. Like, man, that was really weird. That's really out of character for her. Um, Do you guys know that FOMO was a thing even back then? FOMO, fear of missing out. So these people, they, they were starting to feel some FOMO. They were like, man, this woman was really excited. Now I see some people saying, okay, well, what could it hurt? I'm gonna go check it out myself. And so as the buzz started going around and people started going over over there for the fear of missing out, eventually the whole village went to go see for themselves. And at the end of this passage, it says, now we don't believe just because you have said it, we have come to see for ourselves. This woman had an infectious kind of faith. And I hope that while you guys are here at Biola, this is like your well, where you're encountering Jesus, where the the word is instructing you, where you are being equipped and where your, your fires are being fanned into flame. And I hope that when you're at the well, you'll be built up in your knowledge of Jesus, but that you'll know that there's intention for you to go and tell other people about this Jesus so that they can know for themselves because you have been giving a vital voice, and you need to use your power to empower others. There is so much power in the truth of these scriptures. Now, I have just enough time to tell you one quick story. Um, It's one of my favorite stories to tell because it's about my mom. My mom has impacted my faith um, in a a lot of deep ways. Now, my mom, um, she's a great evangelist, but her uh, her techniques are a little bit unconventional sometimes. Mom's kind of an unconventional person all around. Um, But as unconventional as she is, she's very effective sometimes. And so I have, uh, my my older brother has a friend named Chris. Um, And Chris is now a strong believer. He loves the Lord with all his heart. Um, But he wasn't always a believer. And when I asked him, Chris, how is it that you became a believer? He said, well, it was because of your mom. And I said, well, what happened? He said, okay, well, it started when one day I came to your house and I knocked on the door. And um, when I knocked on the door, uh, your mom opened up the door and she immediately said to me, Chris, you must believe what Jesus, you have to. And then she just walked away. She said, Chris, you must believe what Jesus. No sinner's prayer, no explanation. She just said that and walked away. But you know what Chris said? He said that it piqued his curiosity. She said it with so much urgency and with so much conviction. He said, I was a little confused, but over time I started to think, oh, I think I must believe in Jesus. (laughs) Now, I'm going to spare you guys from uh, sounding culturally insensitive when you leave these doors, and I'm going to warn you, please do not go out of these doors and copy my accent when recounting this story. If somebody asks you what was good about chapel today, um, that's just not going to be a good look. Uh, Even if if you are Korean and you think you have that Korean accent down, you are not me, so please don't be talking about my mama, (laughs) right? So I just wanted to encourage you with that story because 
My mom had an urgency about her, and that might not be something that you learn in evangelism 101 class, but my mother, I, I feel like she just walks in the spirit, and sometimes she has a word and she has to tell somebody. It's overflowing in her. I want you to believe in Jesus because life and death is hanging on the balance. It is a vital message. So when you speak truth from the word of God, you are in fact a vital voice. I pray that we would all have that type of urgency that my mom had, that this woman at the well had. I hope that we will know the privilege that it is to be here at this time, getting this education in this place. You are not here by accident. No matter who you are, if you know Jesus and you can, you can communicate something to someone, you are a vital voice. In my time working with youth, I used to tell them all the time, you may be the first Bible that anybody ever reads. So live out your faith. You have been empowered to empower others, as the Great Commission says. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.